Good and happy Friday. Happy Friday, and today is October 2nd. This is episode 15 of our Google Podcasts and all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volt, founder of the Volt Firm and Nimble This. Today, we have news, updates from Cable Labs Interop, Max Transmit Power with eight upstream channel bonding and more on T3 timeouts, partial mode, oh my, T1 timeouts, my recommendations on ad blocking and more. With me is John Downey. Uh, John, I didn't come up with a good title for you today, as I normally do, but we know you are consulting network engineer at Cisco Systems, so good to have you with us. Jack of all trades, masters of none. <laughs> so, um, uh, some, some items in the news today. Um, again, Cable Tech Expo, that's, uh, that's like uh, two Monday. weeks away, one week away, is for yeah. coming up, uh, be in New Orleans, so yeah, we'll see yeah. you there. Um, Apple announced its fourth generation Apple TV coming out in late October. I think one of the neat things about that is they're just going to make it even more easier for people to get over the top video. They've announced some, I think some of the preliminary deals with uh, uh, people like um, uh, it's the, their, their first one is the NBA or not the NBA, the um, uh, baseball, which is, <laughs> uh, so they're going to have some baseball content yeah. in there and they're going to make it really easy for people to search just using Siri to find the TV shows and they, that uh, they, they want to watch. So that's it's funny. Uh, it's funny. Uh, you know, I used to say uh, like uh, field of dreams, if you build it, they will come and, and people are like, Oh, we don't need one gigabit per second. But if you build it and you give it to people, they'll figure out how to use it. Yeah, so, so the, here we go. The, the one thing I really liked about uh, Apple TV, uh, you know, I'm kind of an Apple person, so I watched the announcement. The thing that, that makes it so easy with Apple TV now is when you, you know, you don't have to channel search with Apple TV or with like a Roku box or something like that, or even the previous gen app, Apple TVs, you had to like go to the different different channels, CBS, Netflix, and stuff like that. Now with Apple TV, you can just say that you look for a, a show that you want to watch or look for movies with Kevin Costner. A anyone knows me knows I, I like Kevin Costner. And <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll search through all the ones and it'll pull up The Postman with Kevin Costner, regardless of whether that's on Netflix or iTunes or one of the other things that you have tied into your Apple TV. So I think you know this has kind of changed to make it much easier to find any crap that you want to watch on Netflix. And I think what Apple's doing is really continuing to broker deals so that they can get more and more content. And again, this is just going to drive Doxis usage up across our networks. So that's uh, that's going to keep pushing. Like you said, if, if, if you build it, they'll come. And that's going to drive content over Doxis networks. Um, so hacking continues. Hackers have stolen personal information of about 15 million T-Mobile wireless customers. Uh, including their social security numbers, home phone numbers, addresses, all that type of stuff. Uh, so uh, again, if you're a T-Mobile customer, you probably want to keep an eye on uh, theft. It goes on, on your, with my... On your, on your Ashley Madison <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <account. laughs> that was not my email. I, it was not my email address. It's not my, ba it's not my bag, baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one of the things I, I I don't know if we covered this before is you know, I always recommend I use one I used to use LastPass and I, I switched over to One Password when I started using Mac. But I always recommend people use One Password or LastPass. These are really good password management utilities. Make sure that you can use a different password for every single site that you visit. So you know, if you were a T, if you are a T-Mobile customer and you have to change the password on that now that it's been compromised. You don't have to change passwords on every other site you visit because you have a unique password on, on your T-Mobile site. So these are really nice password management utilities, especially if you work for a company. It makes you change your password every 90 days. Really nice applications to help you uh, manage all the different passwords that you have. And they'll automatically fill in the passwords for every website or different applications that you visit. They also work on your mobile devices, iPhones, Android devices, iPads, Android awesome applications to use. Um, and a lot of these things I've listened to, so our podcasts, the ones that we're doing right now, they're on iTunes, they're on Android stores and stuff like that. You can listen to our podcasts, which I, I ha highly recommend. A lot of people actually do. We're Actually, John, we are the most popular Doxus podcast out there. <laughs> By uh, default, we're the only. 
We're the only ones? <laughs> oh, well, coincidentally, we are the only podcast on doxes, but uh, and, you know, fortunately, that we're number one. It would be really sad if we were the, the number two rated doxes podcast show out there, uh, considering we're the only one. Um, but but the, a podcast I really recommend to people that are interested in, in, in internet security, even, even doxes security, there's a lot of best practice that I've been listening to for for one for quite some time is one on uh, on Tech TV. These are these were started by the uh, one of the founders of uh, uh, the Tech TV network. Uh, uh, is one called Security Now. It's with a guy called Steve Gibson, and it, this guy's really really into into security. Uh, so every week on Tuesday they have a podcast that comes out, and and so I get a lot of my information just on general security things by by them. So uh, after you're done listening to our podcast, listen to the one with Steve Gibson called Security Now, and you can find that through your favorite podcaster uh, just by typing in Security Now. And that brings me to the next thing uh, in in some of Apple's latest releases. They made it a lot easier to put on ad blockers and stuff. So you know we have all this extra data that's coming down uh, when we anytime we surf the web there's actually a small amount of content that comes down in any web page that we watch or that we review but a lot of times people who are putting up the web pages put a lot of ads on because they're trying to generate web uh, revenue uh, on my web page I don't put any ads so I'm, I'm really not concerned about this but I don't like it when I go to some some web pages and there's actually so much content that's externally linked to the, into these web pages it'll take it'll take a long time sometimes 20 30 seconds to download these web pages so there's there's some new ad blockers out there well, the one that's that's kind of recommended right now is called uBlock or uBlock Origins it's a really small plugin for your website and it blocks all this extra advertising coming in so we are kind of we're blocking the advertising, some of the revenue from the sites, but more importantly, there's a lot of malware that's been injected into the Flash, uh, and the Flash is like the the videos that pop up. Sometimes you down you you'll go to a website, and all of a sudden you'll hear a, a lot of background noise because there's ads that start playing. Some obnoxious yeah. guy saying, "Oh, you know, yeah. look at my," and you got to mute that. You can't even find out where it's at. You can't find it because it's at the bottom of the page. It's horribly annoying. So I've I've started using this, these uh, these ad blockers. You block. I put it on all of my browsers: Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and also I put it on my mobile my mobile browsers as well on my iPhone and stuff. And I find. The pages load so much faster because I don't have all this external content linked in, and you're protected from. You know, there's a lot of uh, sites. Sometimes people are getting uh, basically in, injected with malware because these ads are are getting hijacked, and people are putting malware into these ads. So you don't even have to. Sometimes you can accidentally click on one of these ads, and now you're infected. So I mean, what from a security standpoint, we're kind of recommending start putting anti or put, putting these ad blockers in. So it's uBlock. You can just type uBlock in Google or uBlock Origins and install these ad blockers in. Your sites are going to load faster, and you're going to start protecting yourself a little better from this crap that's coming into the uh, ads. And and if people start doing this, you're going to reduce the amount of Doxus utilization from from crap coming down over. So this ties back it's into Doxus. Really it really comes kind of full circle. Yeah. Finally goes full circle. After all that, to make a long story short, too long, too late. Okay. <laughs> so no, that's good information. Yeah, so, that's real good. So you were, um, you know, we missed. Uh, we were supposed to have this hangout last Friday, and uh, you were, your, I guess your plane got delayed. But the important thing was, you were at Cable Labs last week. Correct. And you were at the Cable Labs Interop, which is something that I'm really, really excited to hear about what you saw at the Cable Labs so, Interop so, and what happened. So, so before we go into that, did we, we didn't do a Hangout for September, right? No, we, we were supposed it? to, but you, yeah, you said yeah. something about a plane, <laughs> plane being canceled, flights, something like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't remember what my excuse was. <laughs> at least the one I gave you. Um, well, yeah. we had to delay it. Everyone, I mean, people were standing by <laughs> waiting. The, the, the no. world's most popular Doxus <laughs> podcast, and you couldn't be there. So, so did we ever have an update on IBC? No, no you, we did not. We did not get an IBC update either. You did IBC, didn't you? No, did you I, I, I didn't go. Oh. I didn't go. Oh, I didn't go either. So there's no update. 
<laughs> well, that happen. is an update in a way. <laughs> it did not happen. <laughs> so let me give an update on Cable Labs. Um, there was a public demo of Doxus 3.1 of the Interop, and the Interop was uh, multiple CMTS vendors, test equipment, and cable modem vendors, um, even uh, traffic generators as well. Um, to because it's at Cable Labs, it's usually under non-disclosure agreements. You don't discuss everything that happens. Uh, but because it was a public demo with uh, the press there on Monday, September 21st, I can tell you like what we did and some of the stuff I, uh, we saw. Uh, and I think we're coming along really well with Doxus 3.1. From the Cisco side, we demoed, which I thought was closer to reality of what would be deployed in a real plant, is 32 single channel qualms, so that's DOCSIS 2.0, DOCSIS 3.0, you know, single channel qualms of 256 qualm a piece. Um, and that was cross bonded with an OFDM block. Now the DOCSIS 3.1 OFDM block, we decided to do, we started out with a 96 megahertz wide block. So a lot of people think the spec says the block has to be 192 megahertz wide, but it doesn't. Uh, the spec says 24 megahertz minimum to 192 max for the block. And, and then even if you wanted to make exclusion bands, you could to block out certain areas of that 192 megahertz block. So we decided to do a, one, a 60, 96 megahertz OFDM block, but to make it operationalized, or I'll just make up my own words, <laughs> operationalize it, um, we saw LTE, long-term evolution, 4G cell phone getting in right between 730 and 748 megahertz. So what we did is we purposely made that spectrum 512 qualm, more robust, and then we made sure our our physical link connection, PLC, physical link connection, does that sound right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. PLC. P we made PLC. PLC is only 16 qualms, so it's real robust, and we placed it uh, near 663 megahertz because we knew it was very clean in our spectrum. Yeah, and, and, um, and to, re to recap, the PLC, that's like the, the control mechanism. Correct. That's what keeps uh, everything up and running. Yeah. So if we lose the PLC communication between the CMTS and the cable modem, where the system goes down. I mean, we, we lose, we lose, we lose all Correct. communication. So that's Correct. why it's important to have the PLC very, very robust. Yeah, you want it robust in modulation. You want it in spectrum. You know it's void of LTE or, or maybe even off-air broadcasters, or known suckouts. You know, uh, maybe you have old coax like uh, the old Times Fiber that used to suck out right about 560 megahertz or wherever it was. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be a bad place to put the PLC. We need, that, we need that link between the CMTS and the cable modems to, to stay up all the time. Exactly. So, so we we did the uh, we decided to do 4K QAM, which is 4096 uh, QAM, which that's uh, instead of two to the tenth, that would be two to the twelfth. No, you mean you mean you the twelfth to, to verify Please, this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, two to the twelfth. So either way, we went from you know 256 qualm, which we use in DOCSIS 3.0 of 2 to the 8th power, to 4K qualm, which is 2 to the 12th. So basically, that's 50% more throughput. And the fact that you don't have all these 6 megahertz channels with their guard band and overhead and all that, and it's not MPEG-2 encoded anymore or encapsulated. Because remember, DOCSIS is MPEG-2 encapsulated, while OFDM is not MPEG-2 encapsulated. Uh, so you, you, we get some efficiencies. We get some more robustness. Um, we ran 4K QAM in the good spectrum we knew of. We ran 512 QAM right where we knew we'd have some LTE potential interference. And we ran 1024 QAM near 750 megahertz where we knew some cable plant would have roll off. So we decided let's just let's do a demo and uh, to show that we could do a mixed modulation on a single OFDM channel. So we did that, and I say the constellation was pretty interesting. To be able to see a constellation that is showing everything, uh, 4K, 1K, and 512 all embedded. Plus, my pilots that are in the OFDM are BPSK, so I can see my BPSK constellation. I can sort of take and step back from the constellation. I was using a Rodian Swartz test equipment that would demod the signal, and I could step back and I can actually see the 16 QAM symbol landings embedded in the 4K QAM as well. Um, we went back to Rodian Swartz and uh, we made a suggestion, and this is part of the interop. We made a suggestion it would be cool if you did an aggregate constellation that was color coded so you could see the different constellations laying on top of each other but in different colors oh sure because so, yeah yeah you're, you're seeing you're seeing 512 1024 20, <laughs> 40 96 all at the same time yeah. now, now yeah. one thing i wanted to, to ask about so if i remember correctly for the same mer 
when you're using the new the new error correction, which is uh, LDPC or low density parity check, uh, I believe 10 or 256 QAM is equivalent to 1024 QAM. Is that correct with correct. LDPC? So correct. then 5, 512 QAM is that equivalent to 64 QAM? Is that uh, for, with LDPC? Um, is that, is I, that I, I talked to Roger Fish, who works for Broadcom, and he showed me some of their own testing. I was curious too about the breakpoints for certain uh, modulation, and that's why I was interested in 4K QAM to understand could today's cable plants what would be the minimum MER uh, before I get uncorrectable effect? And surprisingly enough, you know the the 1024 QAM does match up close to our where we break for 256 QAM, which is kind of close to 30 31. Degree. Yeah, 30 yeah, or 31 yeah, dB yeah, MER. Yeah. And normally we want to give ourselves like 3 dB of headroom just in case. But let's just say the break point, knowing what the effect is, forward error correction and all that, and when I start getting uncorrectable effect, it might be 30 dB. Uh, for the 4K QAM, it was closer to 34, 35. Mm -hmm. So, and I have plenty of cable plants that have 36, 37 dB end of line MER. Yep. So yeah, if I have that, awesome. then... Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the whole goal here is if I have a, a typical HFC plant that's node plus three and I have modems off the node and their MERs are in the 40s, well, they easily could do 4K QAM. But then if I have modems end of line after three amps in cascade, maybe their MERs are closer to, say, 35, 36, um, 33, whatever. Maybe those ones in particular use a 1024 QAM. So... Our whole goal here is to eventually have a network that could run off of maybe a back-end SDN, uh, Software Defined Networks, and an application that could look at every modem's end-of-line MER. Now, remember, I think this is interesting, too, is people say, oh, my MER is 35. Yeah, but it's 35 for a single channel. What is it at every single subcarrier? We're talking about almost 8,000 subcarriers. Right. You know, so I need to know the MER across your whole spectrum uh, that you're planning to use. You know, so uh, I might be able to pick out every modem. It's going to be a lot more processing, but you have to pick out every modem and say, all right, you're a good candidate for 4K QAM across the whole board. Uh, you're another modem, but you're good for 512 QAM from 750 to 860, and below 750, I'll do 1K QAM. So eventually it'll get to that point, but, you know, we're just happy to get Doxus 3.1 <laughs> out, uh, out there first, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So we're getting very close. Uh, we are doing trials. Uh, also, I was glad to see that the numbers we hit on speed were hitting ex very close to what I expected in my calculations. So for 32 single channel qualms, I can expect about 1.2 gig. Uh, that was only making one primary and the all of the rest were secondary channels. Because as soon as you make all the downstreams primary capable, you have downstream maps and overhead to support upstream maps. Uh, so you lose maybe one megabit per second off of each downstream when you make a primary. So we did one primary and all the, the 31 extra were secondary only. We got 1.2 gig from that. Then we cross bonded with uh, um, a 96 megahertz 4K qualm mixed and we got about uh, close to 700 megabits per second. So we were getting very close to two gig by cross bonding the 32 with the 96 megahertz. Now, that's interesting because two gig is what we would recommend to offer a one gig service. When you look at stat muxing, you want to have a two gig pipe to be able to offer a one gig service. One and gig service what, to just one user or one gig yeah. service to a bunch of users that are going to hear that? How's that <laughs> well, work well, out? Well, well, that's the whole reason why we want to have a two gig pipe because stat muxing would allow us to oversubscribe it to multiple users to share the two gig pipe by offering one gig service to each one of those people. Right. Now, it might only be 10 people. It might be 15. Uh, you know, what people are comfortable with with oversubscription, it's, you know, it's <laughs> very religious with some people. Yes. You know, a 10 to 1 oversubscription with such a big uh, 1 gig from a 2 gig pipe, you might say no, no more than 5, 5x oversubscription, you know? Uh, yeah. So if you're doing downstream uh, speed of 2 gigabit per second, what's your upstream speed that you have to offer for so, that? So, so say it's a two gig pipe, but we're only offering a one gig service. Uh, typical would be one gig by 100 meg, a 10 to one ratio. Now, the problem with that is, and I think as an industry, we have to start reeling this back a little bit. The 10 to one ratio is easy to manufacture, meaning come up in my head. Uh, 
we would do a 10 to one service, a 20 by two, a 30 by three, a 50 by five, a hundred by 10. Uh, as we start getting up and up and up, it gets to the point where we're starting to really squeeze our upstream because no one's really messing around with our upstream spectrum. They're still doing five to 42 megahertz or five to 40. And not many people are doing five to 85. I have a couple of customers that are doing it, but not many. So if I only have five to 42, five to 40, I'm only going to do four 18 MA channels. That's 108 megabits per second. Well, we already said the speed you offer should be half of the aggregate that you could offer. So if the aggregate pipe is 108, I should not offer more than 50 meg on the upstream. Right. So, so it's that moxing. I mean, how do you, you really need 200 megabits. So, yeah, per yeah. You really should go eight channel upstream bonding uh, and do five to 85 megahertz. Now, if that's, you know, hard to swallow because it will be for HFC plant um, for the, in, for the interim, for the, for the near future. Um, I really think that one gig service could be offered with a 50 meg upstream. The reason why I say that is typically we're worried about upstream being congested with TCP acknowledgements. So when you do downstream TCP, you have acknowledge acknowledgements on the upstream. When you have that Apple TV over the top video, that's adaptive bit rate, that's TCP based. So all that downstream video is going to create upstream traffic. But when you look at typical TCP to upstream, downstream to upstream ratio, it's about a 50 to one ratio. So uh, one gig, and, and we'll see this, um, one gig will generate about 20 megabits per second of upstream acts, depending on the windowing, depending on the act suppression of the modem, uh, selective acts in the uh, application. Um, so there are some certain things that generate acts. So if I do worst case scenario, I very well could have 20 megabits per second of upstream acts. And I didn't even take into account the customer still wants to do upstream uh, telepresence or upstream sending a PowerPoint slide or upstream whatever, maybe Slingbox, you know? So to me, one gig downstream by 50 meg upstream alleviates my 20 meg for my acts, but I still have 30 megabits per second left for actual applications on the upstream. Right. So, so, I, so do we, do you have to do something to enable act suppression? Is that something in the CMTS or the... It's in the cable modem. It's typically already on by default in the cable modem, but what I've found is act suppression is very efficient when you have a single down or upstream flow that's say um, 30, 40, 50 megabits per second. So, um, or actually let's say that on the downstream. If I have 30, 40, 50 down the downstream, the axe 50 down would be one meg up. I'm typically saying a 50 meg down, not being one meg up, but being closer to like uh, 300K, about one third, which is pretty nice. So what's happening is the acknowledgements are going into the cable modem, they're buffering in, and then maybe after four get buffered, the first three drop and only the fourth one goes because it already knows the first three are ahead of it. Right, that, so that makes sense. So, I mean, the acts are still being processed by the cable modem CPU, but they're not being sent as DOCSIS traffic because they're being dropped at the modem. Right. So the act suppression is real nice. I, for instance, I went from 100 meg down, 2 meg up for acts to 100 meg down, 700K on the upstream for acts. So that's more than, um, well, that's about one third, right? Yeah, yeah, no, and this is an awesome savings in the upstream because that you know we we don't uh, yeah, we don't want to yeah. do 200 meg in the up right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, with that said, when we look at because I already I just mentioned that it's big downstream flows like high rate downstream flows, but all your over the top video is separate flows. There's like five meg, seven meg, six meg, ten meg. Um, when you add all those up, it could be 100 meg but they're all separate flows. So you're not going to get the advantage of act suppression because every one of those flows has their own TCP windowing acknowledgements for that flow. So I don't really see act suppression kicking in um, for these low rate flows. You understand what I'm saying? You're saying each flow, if you have multiple users in a, in a house watching different, you know, say one person watching a Netflix video and other persons watching a, an Amazon video, those are different flows. Yeah, so so you could have a cable modem doing 50 megabits per second on the downstream, but technically it could be 10 different 5 meg flows. So I might need, not even see the advantage of act suppression happening right. because the acts are being based on every flow anyway, not not as a whole, not as an aggregate. Mm -hmm. So so I, I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and rely on act suppression, but it is a nice feature. It's usually on by default. Um, and, and um, I still want to guarantee my upstream is big enough to handle the axe at worst case and still have some speed left over for upstream speed. 
what I'm hearing though is marketing is like, it's not what is needed. It's more of what's being marketed by our competition. Google Fiber, gig by gig. Well, I don't know how we're going to do that with uh, coax. Uh, you know, we're going to have to do a five to 204 megahertz upstream and do OFDMA on the upstream to get even close to one gig on the upstream. Yeah. So, I mean, right now, most of what we heard is, is OFDM is just happening on the downstream. Uh, did you, did you see, there was any, uh, is that something that is happening on the upstream? Have we achieved any actual DOCSIS 3.1 capabilities in the upstream OFDMA? So that is, that is good. Um, that's a good question. And uh, I was glad myself to see that the silicon is more mature than I thought it would be. Um, because in my mind, who would deploy CPE? Who would deploy modems today that would do downstream only to only have to change them out and make a truck roll a year from now for, for upstream hardware? Well, they're developing the downstream and upstream at the same time. And some of uh, uh, our vendors and customers and competition competitors of ourselves, they're already doing some OFDMA stuff on the upstream. Uh, we're testing it out as well, but we didn't show it at the, the cable, cable Labs interop. Um, most people seem to be more concerned about downstream at this point than upstream. Um, you know, like I said, for the upstream, I did some math on that. And I said, on the upstream, it's kind of cool because it's, it's bursty. So I, I could have 3.0 and 2.0 modems burst. And then when those modems are not bursting, the spectrum is open. And the 3.1 OFDMA can burst the whole spectrum from 5 to, say, 42 megahertz. Now, 15 to 5 megahertz, you might do, say, 16 qualm. Uh, 15 to... Uh, 38 or whatever, you might do 10, 24 qualm if your MER is good enough. And then you might do 256 qualm as well. So uh, doing some math on that, we could get potentially half a gig in a 5 to 42 megahertz spectrum. So that's half a gigabit per second or 500 megabits per second. So the question will be in the industry, will customers stick to 3.0 upstream ATMA or will they want to time share the OFDMA with the TDMA? And then yeah, the question and that, that concept is you can have your DOCSIS 3.1 modem operating an OFDMA in the upstream along with the legacy DOCSIS 3.0 modems that could have channel bonding in the upstream. So you're, you're, you've got basically the concept of mini slots where DOCSIS 3.0 modems are transmitting bond, bonded mode, and then your OFDMA modem has a mini slot open up and it can burst in an OFDM mode, OFDM mode correct? Correct. Correct. So, you know, another thing I found out I thought was interesting and, and it, it kind of throws not a monkey wrench, but another option into the mix. If I do five to 85 megahertz and I decide to do say a quarantine channel of 3.2 megahertz or 1.6 megahertz for my set dot box, my DOCSIS 1X modems, if they're still there for a TDMA from say 18 to uh, 40 megahertz and then up to 85 megahertz, I do OFDMA. So let's suppose I'm not going to, let the OFDMA squeeze into my ATMA area of spectrum. Maybe I decide to allocate spectrum for ATMA, a quarantine channel, and OFDMA. So I allocate the spectrum. The three one modems are allowed to spread their upstream data across the ATMA and the OFDMA at the same time. So the advantage of that is you've allocated your spectrum to be ATDMA all the time in that certain spectrum, and that 3.1 modem can still burst higher speed. It's cross-bonding, just like on a downstream, it can cross-bond on the upstream. That 3.1 modem could burst four ATDMAs and an OFDMA at the same time and bond across all of them. So it, it's going to operate simultaneously in DOCSIS 3.0 mode and also in DOCSIS 3.1 mode? Is that how you're... <laughs> exactly, exactly. I didn't know it could do that. I, that's actually new. I, I didn't know it, I, it can do I, I didn't either, right? that. And then when I thought about it, you know, some people might decide to do that. It goes back to my principle, keep it simple, stupid. The KISS principle. Because as an RF tech, I would rather see this spectrum is dedicated to these type of channels. And that's what I'm looking at all the time. Uh, this other spectrum is for OFDMA, but the 3.1 modem could still burst higher speed because it can cross bond with the ATMA. Because the other question will come up is, is it easier on my text looking at the spectrum? Is it easier on my CMTS for scheduling of spectrum and mini slots, which I don't know yet? Uh, and 
Is it easier for licensing? Like how do you sell the license for upstream channels? If, if I'm sharing 3.0 spectrum with 3.1 spectrum, do I have to pay twice? It's yeah, sharing so the same spectrum. It really adds a new, a new way of looking at it because I'd never thought about that before. So, yeah, so uh, And I thought that was interesting as well as you know, just a different way of looking at it. And, and, uh, and it was just kind of eye-opening to see the test equipment uh, that was there. Uh, we had Accentus bite blower doing some traffic generation. Uh, Keysight was there along with Rodian Swartz doing constellations. Uh, Viavi, which is the new name of JDSU, they were there doing some constellation D mods as well. Um, Casa, Eris, Huawei, Cisco, we were all there with the CMTSs. Um, so it was interesting. I, I got to see some 16K qualm constellation, which is the highest constellation. I mean, you talk about pipe dream. <laughs> That's definitely a pipe dream. 16K qualm is crazy. The constellation is so tightly packed. Um, so today, so I mean, we go from 4096. Is there is there a reason to do anything between 4096 and 16K? Yeah. So it'd be yeah, 80, 8192. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. 8192 qualm. Yeah, you know, it's it's weird. Is you get into his odd. Oh, this is another good one. Remember, you and I have talked about the odd constellations on the upstream. We talk about a lot of odd things. <laughs> <laughs> like so, 32. You know, 32. Yeah. I often. Yeah. Uh, on the upstream, I always thought the odd constellations, uh, 32 is two to the fifth power. And I thought the odd constellations would take a constellation and, like cut out the corners. Mm -hmm. But 32 qualm, according to the spec for upstream, looks like this. Yeah, it's like rotated. It's, little... it's, like, it's like you take a 16 qualm profile and another 16 and you kind of overlay it up. So the, one si the sides are cut, but not the corners. Right. So your outer symbol landings are almost the same spot as if it was 64 qualm. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. not as robust as you would think or you would extrapolate between 16 and 64. Well, it turned out when we went to 512 qualm, it actually is cutting out the four corners. So it looks like a big cross. The constellation looks like a big yeah. cross. So we do support that in DOCSIS 3.1. So 2 to the 13th power would be 81.92. 2 to the 14th would be, I think, 16 whatever, <laughs> 16K. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just round it off. Um, but the, the odd constellations will probably give us two to three B, db more robustness so maybe there it's nice like i talked to jack moran he works for huawei he was there as well and we talked about how these higher modulations are a uh, they're not a must they're a may like 3.1 cmts cable modem may support 16 qualm doesn't have to and we said yeah it sounds like a pipe dream but i would rather have the flexibility now in the spec and be able to use it five years from now, then not to have it and say, oh, we need to do another silicon spin. Do you understand? Yeah, well, then it also becomes a, a marketing tool later on. If you have a system that has really high MER and you can support 16 qualm, the higher bandwidth yeah. or higher speeds, uh, you have an edge over the competition. So Let me give you an example. What if you had remote phi? What if you had node plus zero? What yeah. if you have RFOG? If you had RFOG, you basically have a node in your house. Yeah. Maybe you have great MER. And you can support six, uh, 16K qualm. And maybe you can support 16K qualm on some subcarriers, and the other ones are 4K qualm. Right. So why not, have the, why not have the speed when yeah. more is better? Yeah. I, I, I took this a step. I went back, and I said to Jack, I said, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been nice if we would have had that mentality with Doxus 3.0 and allowed Broadcom's 1024 qualm to be part of the spec on the downstream? And the 256 qualm be part of the spec on the upstream. Yeah, and I because think some, some of the cable operators have done testing with uh, at least like 256 qualm in the upstream, and I, I think even mm -hmm. 1024 qualm in the downstream. Yes, yes. So Broadcom chipsets support it. The problem is it's hard to operationalize it when you have TI modems out there, Broadcom modems out there, and whoever else is out there, and they don't support they it. They don't support it, right? Yeah. yeah. You have interoperability issues. Which exactly, and that's why it would have been nice to you know have a little fourth foresight and say, you know, let's put it in there, make it part of the spec. It is a little bit more difficult and blah, 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 but it would have given us a little bit more speed for evolving HFC networks that are getting better MERs now. Yep. All right. So anything else exciting uh, from the, from the era? Uh, um, no, we were there like two weeks, um, uh, setting up equipment, getting it all up and running. Everything went fine. 
Uh, I would say the only weird one that you and I have talked about, another weird one, <laughs> strange one, was TCP testing. You know, always test with UDP, test with 1500 byte Ethernet frames, set your baseline. That way you're not, you know, keep it simple. Uh, but then when we went to TCP, there's a lot of things that could come into play with TCP. Uh, the TCP windowing, the, uh, the application itself, the multiplication factor of the windowing, maybe act suppression on the modem, maybe selective acts in the applica application. So there was some manipulation we had to do on TCP to actually see our service flows um, stay pretty consistent. Like a lot of times TCP would kind of be salt tooth. It'll go up, and it'll come down because of the windowing, it'll go back up, it'll come down because it's readjusting its TCP windowing. It might say, hey, here's two downstream frames, one act. Here's four downstream frames, here's an act. Here's 16 downstream frames. Oh, I dropped my act. Let's drop back down to two downstream frames. So now all of a sudden your TCP is kind of like up and down. Uh, but overall, uh, we got uh, the speeds that I thought we would get. Our pie in the sky demo was 32 single channel qualms cross bonded with 192 megahertz of 4K qualm. And we got very close to three gigabits per second. So, I mean, that was very nice to be able to see that. We didn't get it with the same. This is another thing is the modems that are coming out don't have 10 giggy ports on them. Because what good is that if they're hooked up to a PC that doesn't have a 10 giggy port? <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of homes that are going to support 10 gigabits per second. So that's, so, but you know, for a long time, modems only had uh, 100 megabit per second ports on it. And yeah. then it wasn't until Doxus 3.0 that eventually modems started uh, changing the 100 megabit per second port to gigabit per second port. So I think there will be a time it, yeah. you know, in, in the future that we yeah. will actually have gigabit or 10 gigabit per second yeah, I agree. Uh, port prices, on prices, the modems. Prices, yeah, prices will come down. It'll be cheaper to do it. And it'll be like, even if you don't need it, it's the same price. So who cares? Yeah, prices yeah, will vary right. depending on your supplier. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> As advertised. <laughs> Start scrolling all the cutters now. Yes. <laughs> so, so what I'm seeing is most of the modems has four one gig e ports. So what you can do is it's all like a built-in switch, and you can hook up multiple ports uh, and then run multiple flows and whatever. And and from what I was seeing, I'm, I can see a single modem getting 2.5, 2.6 gig. Uh, it was easier to do two modems with multiple gig e ports to show the close to three gig. Do like 1.45 or whatever it was on each modem. Right. So very, very interesting. We even uh, I'm doing some testing now because we're going to show the same thing at SCT Expo, uh, and and uh, shameless. This is not shameless. It's shameful. <laughs> I'm going to give a shame, <laughs> shameful plug to myself. Uh, <laughs> shameless, shameful plug. I don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> Just give the plug, John. Just give yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I am doing a workshop on this type of stuff uh, Tuesday at three o'clock in New Orleans. What's weird because the show doesn't open till Wednesday. So they put my workshop the same day as the cybersecurity symposium. And then right after my workshop at 5.30, we have the IP challenge. So there's the uh, Cisco party where we do the IP challenge, like Jeopardy and all that, and free beer, booze, you name it. I'll so my, that, workshop, yeah. my workshop is Tuesday at 3. Uh, that's my shame, shameful plug. <laughs> Shameless, shameful. <laughs> um, so so we're going to demo the same stuff we had at Cable Labs and potentially do more. I was able to turn on two OFDM blocks because the modems are supposed to support two OFDM blocks. Each 196 and, uh, megahertz wide. 196 megahertz wide, correct. Yeah. So we just did that uh, yesterday, and between 32 single channel qualms and two OFDM blocks, we got uh, 2.45 2 gigabit per second. Multiplied by a two gives us uh, 4.9. Right, is yes. that right? Yeah, it was, it was uh, pretty impressive. So we're getting about 1.8 gig for every block. So 1.8, 1.8 is 3.6, plus the 1.2 is 4.8. So yeah, we're getting very close to 4.8 gigabits per second. Yeah, you know, I'm happy with 100 meg service right now. I'm not <laughs> sure what I'd do with that, but I would take it if someone wanted to set me up with that as a test environment. So. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's move on to questions uh, from our uh, from our listeners. Our first question comes from Reinhard in K Cologne, Germany, and he says, uh, and it, this is very uh, uh, appropriate to a conversation because he has a question regarding the max transmit power uh, on a new modem that he has that supports eight channel bonding in the upstream. 
uh, and he wants to know what the max transmit power for more than four more than when he has more than four channels bonded because uh, he's moving to eight channel bonding and the DOCSIS spec uh, for DOCSIS 3.0 does not specify any more than four channels bonded in the upstream. Yeah, so um, the modem's transmit power, its max transmit power, is based on modulation. Now let's assume for this example it's 64 qualm, which is the highest modulation we can do in the upstream for ATDMA. And four channel upstream bonding, the spec says 51 dBmV max power per channel. Well, when you double it to eight channels in the upstream, it drops another 3 dB, so it's 48 dBmV. Now, with that said, there was a Cable Labs ECN that was put out years ago to be able to go up to 54 dBmV uh, for four channels and potentially 60 dBmV for four channels. Not many modem vendors did that because it's more power, more heat, more cost to do higher power. Um, so I have seen modems that are doing eight channel bonding, 64 qualm, max out at 48, which I believe that is a very l short sighted type of uh, uh, feature, meaning they should have implemented the ECN because if I started saying you have max output of 48 dBmV, they're going to be like, ah, it's not going to work in my cable plant. Uh, I can't place that modem off a high value tap. I can only place that modem off the low value taps where I normally transmit only 40 dBmV. So, um, it, with that said, I've seen other vendors incorporate the ECN and they're coming out at 51 or 54 dBmV per channel, which is a lot more than 48. Right. So that ECN, which is extended transmit power, do you know, um, and I haven't checked it, the Cable Labs website, do you know if, the, if it's listed which modems on the Cable Labs website uh, did accept the, or did go with the extended transmit power ECN and which didn't, or is I'm not sure. contact the vendors themselves? Yeah, I think you're you're probably better off contacting the vendor themselves because even if they support it, you still have to make sure you have the right firmware. Because even if the hardware supports it, the firmware may not have activated it properly. Right. So you might need new firmware. Uh, firmware upgrade. upgrade. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so, so the I mean, answer is 48 would be the 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 worst case scenario for eight eight channels in the upstream. Yeah. Uh, you know what's interesting about that? I, I went back to Roger Fisher Broadcom. I said, I'm having this debate on upstream power levels as well for OFDMA. If you take an OFDMA and do the equivalent 6 megahertz, I'm just going to say equivalent 6 megahertz compared to 6.4 megahertz because, you know, the ATDMA 6.4 is really only 5.12 symbol rate, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take this equivalent 6 megahertz OFDMA, it turns out the power level, it's kind of convoluted, it's about 2 dB higher than the ATDMA spec for DOCSIS 3.0. I think that's the math we came up with. I'll have to run that through Ron Hranick again because you know how he likes to run the math. <laughs> <laughs> and also the grammar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not an acronym, it's initialism. It is not, yeah. He's, he's caught me on that just recently. So, all right, next question comes from my friend uh, Chris in Belgium. And uh, back to T3 timeout errors. Um, so he knows these these occur on a cable modem when they send their range request message and, and they don't receive the range response within 200 milliseconds from the CMTS. Yeah. After 16 times, the modem resets its cable interface and restarts registration process. Um, what he wants to know, is this a full restart of the modem or a reinitialization re uh, with the same downstream in UCD? So you sent me this question, these questions earlier and I wrote back to you and I'm going to try to quote what I said. So it might be the same, might not be. And I want you to add in because, you know, if you've gone through this like ad nauseum, right, with when you worked for um, um, the Docs Protocol Analyzer. What mm -hmm. was it called way back when? Uh, was, well, people Sig call tech. it the SIG tech, but <laughs> ST260. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 261B. Yeah, right? and anyway, yeah, it was different depending on what version and stuff. So. so I know you were very intimately involved in, you know, modem registration and all that as well. But, you know, looking from the CMTS side and as far as Cisco goes, um, we do station maintenance every 15 seconds. If we don't get a response back from the cable modem, this is what you're talking about right here, mm -hmm. um, we will go into a fast polling mode every second. If we don't get a response within 16 total tries, we, we quit sending downstream sick messages and uh, no more station maintenance to the modem. Well, that modem has a T4 timer of 30 seconds. Every time the modem gets a downstream message from the CMTS, that T4 reinitializes, so it's another 30 seconds. So 
Um, even though that T4 is clocking down, it keeps resetting every time this cable, the CMTS sends a poll back to it and says, hey, I want to know how you're doing. Levels, frequency, timing, and, and pre-equalization adjustments. So once the CMTS decides, hey, 16 times, I'm tired of talking to you, I'm not going to talk to you, that modem's T4 timer after about 30 seconds will drop off. Now the modem's going to start rescanning downstream. It may retry the downstream it knew was good last because it caches it. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, it'll scan either from top to bottom, meaning it might start at 555 and work its way down. It might start at 453 and work its way up depending on the type of vendor it is. You know, I've seen both. And then after I've seen also where modems will scan the frequencies every six megahertz pretty quickly. And then after about a minute or less than a minute, jump back to a cached frequency and say, oh, is it did it come back up? Oh, it's not there. Let's continue ca or scanning the rest of my table. Let's go back. Is it there? No, continue scanning. So I've seen, you know, different scenarios where it could take a long time, or <laughs> if the modem is bad, it might actually scan, go back, scan, go back, scan, go back, and keep doing the same loop and never get out of that loop. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, I think you're covering it very well. And, and the answer to, to quote Ron Rannick is, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the cable modem. And so, I mean, like I've seen, like you said, using the DOCSIS protocol analyzer and then also uh, just in, in the field and stuff is some modems, the first thing they'll do and, and what we like to see the first thing they do is try the the last frequency they were you know the if, if they were registered registered with the cmts they they did 15 t3s they, they timed out gave a t4 so they're they're gonna they're gonna re you know basically try it again they went offline let's try the first the last frequency we were just on and see if maybe there was just some issue because we don't really want to rescan if they just got popped off because of some noise issue yeah. That's not always the, that's not, so that's the kind of the ideal thing we want to see, but it's not always exactly what happens, again, depending on, on the modem vendor and the modem firmware that's on there. So we and can see, a, yeah, we can see a whole host of things happen, just like you said, we'll see modems start scanning at different frequencies, we'll see them do a whole bunch of things, but uh, it, it completely depends on the modem. So then once it does lock in a downstream, it should have cached its last UCD upstream channel descriptor. Or two. Know it's Sometimes they'll cache two yeah. different Good point. frequencies. Yeah. yeah. And, and its upstream transmit power. The only thing it's not supposed to really remember is its time offset. It should readjust its time offset. And the reason why is if I had a power outage my entire cable plant, you wouldn't want all your modems coming back at the same instant in time with proper timing because they would all collide in the CMTS and have to back off with an algorithm the range back off algorithm. Right. But if they all, if they all have uh, no real time offset set, if they all came on at the same time, because they are different distances away, they would actually hit the CMTS at different times. And that is actually better in that regard for like a total power outage. So, um, so it, to make things worse, <laughs> I'm the, br the bringer of bad news, um, that T4 timer by default in the CMTS when you're doing four channel upstream bonding, there's a T4 multiplier. We multiply by four because of four channel upstream bonding. So that 30 second timer is actually 120 seconds now. So you might not see that modem lose its downstream LED link light for two minutes straight. So you're like, you're like uh, rolling your fingers saying, you know, what the heck's going on? Uh, I'm sitting here waiting for this thing and it's not even scanning downstream. Well, it might be still stuck on its T4 timer for two minutes. You're better off power cycling the modem. Right. Yep. And eight channel bonding would even be worse, right? <laughs> eight channel upstream bonding would be eight times 30 is 240 seconds, four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, because what happens, uh, the more upstream channels you have, it's going to each different channel in the upstream. It's now you're not going to be doing a range request every 30 seconds for a single upstream, you're going to do, or well, as you said, 15 seconds for each upstream, it's going to do a, a range request for upstream one, a range request for upstream two, and, and now, so it does increase yeah. the amount of time. Yeah. So. All right. Let's keep moving. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, but we're going to do one last question, and then uh, uh, that, that's going to, we'll, we'll call, it, uh, call it a wrap on that. And so this is from Maria in San Jose. What are the primary reasons if the upstream partial mode does not come back to UB after some recovery time? So UB is upstream bonding. 
And if it says slash P, it's upstream bonding partial mode. You can do a show cable modem partial service to see which upstreams are bad, or you can do a show cable modem MAC address for both, and you can see which upstreams don't say STA. STA is uh, uh, station maintenance. They might say DR, which is uh, disabled or ranging. Uh, it might say uh, CONT for continue. Uh, by default, in the Cisco CMTS, we have um, on failure continue ranging. So continue ranging on failure. That means if I lose a station maintenance um, burst on one of those upstreams and the CMTS decides my MER is low or whatever and the station maintenance is not coming through on that upstream, it's like getting a lot of flaps in a flap list for that upstream, I will mark that upstream DR for disabled with ranging continue. When, so that means I'm still ranging on it every so often, it's normal every 15 seconds I'm ranging on it. Um, and if it comes back and I get the ranging back, I can take it out of that DR back to STA. And now it goes from slash P to slash UB, upstream bonding. So dynamically, it should come out of partial mode and go back to bonding. Now, with that said, I've seen cases where modem said partial mode and I just did a reset on the modem. It came back bonding, no problem. I'm like, well, wait a minute. If the upstream was good enough to work, why didn't it come back on its own automatically? So I've had cases where time offsets were the issue, where a modem's time offset was kind of drifting. And when it drifts, it doesn't get its station maintenance in the proper time slots. So now all of a sudden I see in the flap list a lot of misses compared to hits in the flap list. Or I go to the modem, I see lots of T3 timeouts. When I see that, uh, that could be the culprit causing the station maintenance not to work, causing the channel to go down. And every time it tries to range in that channel, it's not going to come back, even though my MER is perfect. When I reboot the modem, the time offsets reset, and everything looks good again. So there are cases where, just like we said, it depends. It could be an MER issue on that specific upstream frequency for that specific modem. It could be a time offset issue on that modem. Um, so there are a multitude of things that could cause uh, this partial mode. To make the waters even muddier, we are looking at the station maintenance burst. Now, some people are running mod profiles that the station maintenance is QPSK and the data itself is 64 qualm. Um, that can actually muddy the waters, meaning the modem might never go to partial mode because QPSK is so robust. Right. And, and we've got <laughs> all your data yeah. Yeah. run station maintenance at 16 qualm, ne yeah. never QPSK. Q 16 qualm is the highest you can run, but that's going to that's gonna make a lot of improvements. It's going to improve pre-equalization. It's going to improve the SNR, the, the, actually the, the, the value of the SNR because it's going to more closely rela uh, represent the SNR that your data is, is, is running at. If your data is running a 16 qualm or if your data is running a six, 64 qualm, because QPSK is going to actually say what your data is rather than 16 qualm, which punches through a lot of noise. It's Q, QPSK is way too robust to, to be giving you a good represent, representation of what your SNR actually is in the upstream. Yes. Yeah, and QPSK in an ATDMA profile uses a QPSK zero preamble which is a lower amplitude than what 16 qualm and 64 qualm uses because they use a QPSK1 preamble. That preamble is at the beginning of the burst and it's about 3 dB higher in, in, in magnitude on the constellation. Right. So you usually go into 16 qualm on a station maintenance, ends up being, having a preamble that's a little bit higher in amplitude, might give a better MER reading, uh, more robust MER reading levels. It affects ping doxis, it affects my flap list, it affects my upstream partial mode. It can also affect uh, the pre-equalization. I think you and I have talked about that as well. Yes. Yeah, and, and one other thing on this question about why the uh, the partial mode may stay in partial mode, and I know we've covered this before, is in the earlier iOS versions when we were first doing channel bonding in the upstream, I believe that when a, a channel would drop off, the, the CMTS wouldn't recognize the recovery. It would not bring that bonded channel back on. Is that is that correct? Um, and that might have been the default setting was uh, disabled without continuous ranging, like um, on failure disable. And but as I know now, the default is on failure continue ranging. Now I remember one of our you know our uh, customers, they had an issue with some old TI modems in the field that when they went to upstream bonding partial mode, they were putting out a CW carrier at 10 megahertz. For, and my DOCSIS channel wasn't even uh, uh, configured for 10 megahertz. It was configured for 24 megahertz. 
But for some reason, this device was pumping out a CW carrier, which in normal circumstances, no one really cared, but it was affecting their set-top box signal. Mm -hmm. So we, we changed the default from on failure, disable the automatic recovery. So uh, that way, if a modem ever went to partial mode, it wouldn't generate the CW carrier and affect all the set-top boxes. So there was a case where the customer would have to monitor all the modems in partial mode in the upstream and then figure out, you know, uh, maybe I could reset them manually and they'll be fine. Uh, or I have to check to see if their MER is good or figure out why they went to partial mode in the first place. Because maybe their MER is bad at, say, um, maybe they have one of their 18 mate channels at 38 megahertz center frequency and it's roll off at the house and the transmit power is trying to do 54 and it couldn't do it. Right. Okay. Well, I think we've covered uh, we've covered a number of questions. I actually have a bunch more questions. We're probably going to have to do a Q and A where we just do nothing but uh, questions and answers to get through all these. But that's what happens on the world's number one Docs podcast show. <laughs> we just got too much coming in. So. <laughs> hey, hey, you need to uh, make one of those little ribbons so we can put it on Rob uh, Ron's ribbon thing that hangs down from his chin. No, no, no. Ron won't be able to put it on because he's not on this podcast. So you and I get to to, to wear that. So. All right. You need to put it out too, and I'll wear it like with pride. There you go. All right, John. We'll call it a wrap. Thanks. And to our listeners, uh, keep the questions coming. We'll answer them on here. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye.